Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hello, everyone. Angie, we've finally completed another decade of Joel Schumacher. Yes. It's weird. Like, I guess this was, what, like double the films of last time? Whereas at the end of the 70s, I was like, wait, we're already doing a recap? And now I'm like, oh, yeah, we did kind of do a lot, didn't we, for 80s? Yeah. Actually, no, we only did five. Was it five? Okay. Only five films, and that's exactly how many we did in the 70s, too. (laughs) That's weird. I don't know why it feels like more. It just does. Well, it's a surprisingly sparse decade, but I guess it was an eventful decade. Yeah. We're definitely going to slow down when we hit the 90s. (laughs) (laughs) Let me just check. I think that's going to take us a year, if not more. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that probably is his busiest. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So that one's already set to take us a year to get through. Hey, we got through two decades in a year. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, just to kind of recap for people, the decade that was the 80s for Joel Schumacher, he began in 1981 with The Incredible Shrinking Woman, which was a passion project by Lily Tomlin and her partner Jane Wagner, mm-hmm. that Joel just stepped in as a fill-in director when John Landis left, and it's his first theatrical film, it's his first big film for a studio, it was his first film with a large budget. Mm-hmm. Angie, did you recommend Incredible Shrinking Woman? I'm pretty sure I did. I mean, it's a movie I have a lot of nostalgic fondness for, so it was really fun to revisit it again for this. I recommended it too. I think a little wobbly script construction, but it was a lot of fun, really inventive, yeah. very zany, especially once you mm-hmm. got to the gorilla and the cops. <laughs> yes. I had a lot of fun with it. I could definitely see why it stuck around throughout the decade. Mm. And then after that, in 1983, we got to DC Cab, yes. which was his comedy about a ragtag crew at a DC Cab company, hence the title. Mm-hmm. And Angie, did you recommend DC Cab? DC Cab is a little bit more of a mixed bag. There's some problematic characters and jokes in there for sure, but there's also Mr. T, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I recommend it too, definitely with the same uh, content caveats Mm -hmm. in terms of aspects of early 80s raunchy comedies that haven't quite aged well. But again, a lot of fun, a lot of energy, some really, really great sequences, a great cast of just such weird eccentric people all thrown into a movie together. Mm -hmm. And not only Mr. T, but the Barbarian Brothers. Yes. (laughs) So I did recommend that one, too. Mm -hmm. And then we hit the only thing that we've had to skip on this project so far, and that's the 1985 short-lived TV series codename Foxfire, which Joel was the creator of. I don't believe he actually wrote or directed any of it. We were hoping to at least cover the pilot film. We have not been able to get our hands on it yet, so we're putting a pin in that. If we ever get our hands on it, we will put it in the schedule. So I can remember that I didn't recommend that one. (laughs) Well, you did not recommend it either. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Yes, our positions are ambivalence. So that's one, if we come across it, we'll probably slip in during one of the decade breaks. Mm -hmm. Also in 1985, that's when we got the Brat Pack classic, St. Elmo's Fire. Yes, I did recommend that one. It is a entertaining movie full of charming actors playing terrible people. Yes. (laughs) That's the best way I can describe that movie. That It's enjoyable to watch, but they're kind of not good people at all. And I didn't recommend it because I question how aware the film is of just how terrible these people mm. are in the tones <laughs> with which they played some of the scenes. I didn't hate it. Right. I don't not recommend it. I think there's a great cast, a lot of fun sequences in there. And I can see why it was a part of the pop culture landscape that it was. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it all came together. And it's just like some of the scenes were just like, what? Yeah. Not so much in terms of what's happening, because you're allowed to do something that goes down problematic roads. It's just a question of mm-hmm. how you approach it. Well, yeah. I mean, I think the whole Kirby thing, they were yeah. definitely tone deaf on that. <laughs> yeah. 
staring through the window, jaunty keyboard music. <sighs> yeah. And then 1986, we get the first of our Joel Schumacher Presents productions, basically, <laughs> where he executive produced the Showtime TV movie Slow Burn, a noir starring Eric Roberts and Beverly D'Angelo. Yes. And did you recommend this one, Angie? I did not. And let me tell you, as I was thinking today about doing this episode, I'm like, what happened in Slow Burn? <laughs> What was that movie? Like, Eric Roberts is in it, right? Was he the protagonist? Like, that's how little of an impact this movie made on me that, you know, however many months later, I'm sitting here going, what was that about again? I didn't recommend it either. The only great gift it gave us was miscast Dan Hedaya. Yes. <laughs> So 1987 is definitely one of the touchstones of Joel's career mm -hmm. when he directed The Lost Boys, which yes. again held up as one of the classic films of the 80s. Mm -hmm. Did you recommend that one? I think I had some caveats, but for the most part, I recommended it. My only issues were like, it could have been better in a few areas, mm -hmm. but good Lord, do I still love what we got. Yeah, I really didn't like the lead. I can't even remember his name now. J but. Yeah, Sean Patrick, Jason Thomas Flannery, mm -hmm. buddy dude. Yeah. Not Chris, because we have all Chris's now. That was before the era of Chris's. Oh, yeah, you're <laughs> right. right. <laughs> the, the Corey's, not the Chris's, yeah. Jason Patrick. Okay, yeah. Because that was the era where you had Jason Patrick, Neil Patrick Harris, Sean Patrick Flannery. <laughs> it was the era of the Patricks. <laughs> And none of them had a first name, Patrick, but they all had Patrick's. Right. I did not have quite the same level of issues you did, but I just thought mm -hmm. there was some aspects of the writing that I wish they had dug in a little more. Sure. But I still love, I, again, it's just the direction, the music, the mm -hmm. cinematography, the vampires. Yeah. Alex Winter's coat. <laughs> and Rat Tail. Yeah. And, oh, Rat Tail. <laughs> and the Frog Brothers. Yes. And then we wrapped up the decade. Again, this was a pretty short one. Yeah. In 1989 with Cousins, the romance mm -hmm. drama with Ted Danson and Isabella Rossellini. Right. Looking back on it, do you remember if you enjoyed it? I remember I found it pretty bland. And then we watched the original <laughs> French one. And suddenly it looked like a masterpiece. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I don't know that it's a film I would go back to much, but mm. it had its charms and it had depth. I'll give it that. I can see content wise why it's not the most exciting sell yeah. of Joel Schumacher's sure. career because, you know, it's middle aged romance, drama, affairs, mm -hmm. all that stuff. I still think it's the best movie we've covered on the show so far. Hmm. I just really, really loved the richness of how the material was put together, how he directed it. He juggled the tones perfectly. I loved the relationships and the complexities of the characters. And again, the with or without you dance sequence is <laughs> cinema gold. And I'm not saying that with hyperbole. I thought that was just a really remarkably well put together sequence. And that it's cringeworthy, but yeah. <laughs> it's cringeworthy, but it's supposed to... It's, yeah, I mean, no, I, I'm with you. I know it's intentional. Yeah. It's just... Yeah. But they're doing the sway. Oh, man. <laughs> I really just love the whole construction of it, both in the mm -hmm. writing and in Joel's direction. Mm -hmm. I've actually gone back and rewatched it again since, and I really love it. Hey, yeah, that original French film was terrible. Yeah, so bad. How dare you 70s movie critics? <laughs> <laughs> Oscar nominations. How dare dare you 70s what in the world granted the 70s also enjoyed bloom and love so mm. and then in early 1989 like one month after cousins came out joel made his stage directorial debut in chicago mm. with a staging of david mamet speed the plow and i'll get into a little more detail on that near the end of the episode okay so angie yeah looking at this decade as a whole I'm not even going to ask if you think this is a good decade because we're definitely seeing his rise in his career. So it was a good decade sure. for him. Yeah. How do you feel, Joel, now that he has become a feature director, how do you feel that he has developed himself or developed his style and developed the type of stories he likes to tell? What impresses me is the wide range of styles we've got here. You know, we've got comedy, we've got drama, we've got horror. He's all over the place, really. But while I don't know that I would necessarily say that he was spectacular at any specific one, he's really good at all of them. Mm -hmm. I feel like if there is anything that maybe is the strongest, it's probably the humor. Mm. Even in films that aren't necessarily like comedies, he still manages to bring out a lot of those humorous moments oh, yeah. and really make them work and 
I was not expecting, like, I guess when I think about Joel Schumacher as a director, I don't think of him as a comedy director, but I certainly am now after doing this decade. And we even saw this in the 70s with the films that he wrote is there is a warmth and a humanity to his comedy, Mm -hmm. which I think gives it a lot of charm and relatability. Yeah. I mean, even like Lost Boys, you know, has whole things about like, you know, kids dealing with their mom dating, you know, or Mm -hmm. making new friends with the weird guys at the comic shop, you know? (laughs) Yeah. There's a warmth to a lot of the comedy, even DC Cab. It's a lot about this kind of odd family that's built around mm-hmm. this company. But I agree with you. I kind of like that he did five films and I like that he had this intentional desire to do different kinds of movies because he didn't right. want to get pigeonholed. Sure. And he made five very distinct movies. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you didn't tell anyone that these films were made by the same director, I don't think anyone would have thought. No. Maybe like St. Almost Fire and Cousins, but they're so distinct in each of their individual approaches. Mm -hmm. And yet I still think there is a similar level of craftsmanship to his work and the way he puts scenes together, the way he puts the stories together, the way he likes to juggle tones Mm -hmm. and also stylistically, visually. Yeah. We haven't had anything quite as flamboyant as the Batman movies yet. No. What I kind of like is that he's not like Tim Burton where every film is done with the same style. Style. Looks exactly the same, right? Yeah. Right. He's letting each film inhabit its own world with its own style, and mm-hmm. yet it's kind of similar in how he approaches each of the unique styles. Yeah. Like Incredible Shrinking Woman and Lost Boys both certainly have a lot of use of color mm-hmm. and what's the word? Like they're less realism and more it's vibrant. Vibrant, yeah. But yet they're still very much their own separate things mm-hmm. that fit their respective moods. Yeah. And I love how he does a really great job of using the sets to build the world, using the costumes to build the characters. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, Incredible Shrinking Woman, it was a lot of pastels and the suburb consumerism visual style with the Mm -hmm. very bright colors and all that stuff, but everything looks kind of plasticine and fake. Right. DC Cab, everything is grimy, grungy, run down, torn up until they get all their money and suddenly it's all shiny and yellow. (laughs) St. Elmo's Fire with its mix of the whole 80s chic (laughs) <laughs> fashion mm-hmm. mixed with the punk aspects that were coming yeah. up in the nightclubs and of course mm-hmm. lost boys going full punk <laughs> but even bringing in kind of like a neon steam i think he doesn't go full neon but there is a kind of almost black light feel to some of it mm-hmm. and then cousins which is middle-aged white people but man does he make it pop <laughs> again the weddings all the wedding yeah. scenes in that it's like everything is really stylish and fashionable and tacky and ugly at the same time I did just realize thinking about it in Cousins, the son's room in their apartment Mm -hmm. has a very similar feel to how Andrew McCarthy was doing his room and apartment in San Elmo's Fire. Mm. It's that kind of like artsy, eclectic, all over the place design, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, yeah, because one was a writer and one was a film student. And then Mm -hmm. you even compare them to like Corey Haynes' bedroom. Yeah. And it's again, it's got that similar kind of cluttered feel, but again, Again, it's building the world of this character. Mm-hmm. Still doesn't explain the Rob Lowe poster. <laughs> <laughs> and then what do you think about his juggling of tones, the way he likes to kind of almost all over the map, but in deliberate right. ways? He definitely improved in this decade than some of the attempts in the prior decade. Because, you know, I, I felt like the juggling of tones in the car wash was really jarring to me sometimes. Mm-hmm. But yet here, whether it was, you know, Cousins or DC Cab, it was okay for it to go from serious to funny, you know, like it seems like he's getting a much better feel for much more natural shifts in tone, I think. Yeah. And again, I think the only one that still doesn't quite work for me is St. Elmo's Fire. Mm -hmm. But even then he's swinging. He's swinging for the fences. You can tell he's trying to do some interesting stuff with it. I just don't think he quite lands as well as he does in all the others. I mean, yeah, Incredible Shrinking Woman, the way that it mixes its satire with the Mm -hmm. genuine sadness of a person going through an increasingly debilitating illness, basically. Mm Mm-hmm. Of course, Lost Boys, the way that it mixes the horror and the humor and the action and the teen right. drama and all that stuff. And Cousins, again, the whole range of emotions in Cousins. There's anger, there's sadness, there's longing, there's happiness. Mm-hmm. And DC Cab, the only reason I left that is it, that's kind of the only one that's more of a singular tone. Why do I feel like there was some degree of dramatic moments in that one? Am I getting it confused with other stuff, maybe? I mean, like there was a bit with Bill Maher where he's talking about you're a struggling artist who's driving yeah. a cab to make ends meet, but then you realize you've become a cab driver who just does art on the side. That was Bill Maher's fault. 
<laughs> it was a good moment. You know, and then you have the one guy who runs the company is struggling to keep it afloat. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't quite as dramatic as the dramatic moments of Car Wash. You're correct. Yeah. But even then, you know, you get all the wild action of the whole climax and the camaraderie mm-hmm. of everyone. Right, right. And Irene Cara being there for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> And the inspiration of Mr. T's speech outside the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen the light. Oh, Mr. T. So does this range of films, because you know, both you and I were coming into this project, kind of you know, mixed experience levels with Joel. Mm-hmm. Does his progress here through the 80s make you look forward to the 90s? Yeah. If anything else, I'm even more interested in those ones that I haven't seen Mm -hmm. to see how they might surprise me. You know, what style is he going to head toward next? I maybe haven't seen him do before. I'm starting to feel much more confidence in him as a director so that I just kind of want to see anything that he'll put in front of us. Yeah, and me too. Most of the stuff that I've seen, we're getting into that era. Sure. But it's been a while since I've watched any of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to view it through the lens of how does he build his worlds? How does he build his characters? How does he juggle tones? I mean, of course, you know, the Batman Mm -hmm. movies, even just setting them aside, I'm really curious to revisit some of the kind of more thrillers and drama works. Right. And even the Batman movies, I'll be honest, you know, I'm really <laughs> trying to lock away my preconceived notions of them and just mm-hmm. trying to see as we're building our way there, will we get a better sense of how they became what they became, even kind of knowing why they became what they became. I don't know, man. Batman and Robin. I've tried to watch that movie with an open mind before. I don't know. Maybe watching all of his career might change things, but I don't know. Just to correct, I'm not saying to make it better of a movie. I hear you. But will it <laughs> will it go from being this thing that kind of overshadowed the rest of his career to merely mm-hmm. just being a stage in a career? Right. I gotcha. And then one of the other things that's kind of worth noting is he has not had a hit yet. Nor has he had a bomb. All of these films, they did okay. Lost Boys just became a cult hit on video. And almost all of these, especially Incredible Shrinking Women, St. Elmo's Fire, and Lost Boys, Mm -hmm. didn't really hit the pop culture zeitgeist until they hit the home video market. Mm -hmm. DC Cab, you know, people like that on HBO. Honestly, Cousins is the one that I think people have had the least exposure to just because it's not as interesting of a sell. Yeah. But again, I highly recommend people at least give that one a shot. But it's kind of interesting that he still has not really hit the A-list yet Mm -hmm. and that none of these films has opened at number one. Right. And yet none of them bombed because they all at least did two, three times their budget. Yeah, they hung on for a while, most of them. They all opened around like five or seven, but then they held the five or seven slot for like six, Mm -hmm. seven weeks. They all did decently. It's going to be kind of interesting as we get into the 90s where I know that's where he first hits his big hits. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, everything goes nipples, you know? (laughs) Right. And what's funny is, yeah, we're halfway through his chronology of his career, but we're not even halfway through because, man, again, yeah, the 90s are going to be a busy time. Yeah. And then even the 2000s. He has 11 films. It's like a good year's worth of films in the 2000s, too. I think that probably really speaks to his diversity, too, because Mm -hmm. you would think a movie like Batman and Robin would possibly kill somebody's career. Right. You know, I think what we're seeing in the 80s is I can understand why he was able to build the career he did Mm -hmm. in that, yeah, he definitely built a reputation as a director that actors liked working with Mm -hmm. because he usually brought together a really interesting cast and let them do interesting things with the characters. He had a really good eye for interesting material and storylines, even Mm -hmm. when he wasn't himself originating them. And again, the variety of types of films that he could direct. I mean, this is like a perfect calling card for, you know, hey, hire me. <laughs> right. you know, I mean, yeah, if he tries one style of film and it tanks, hey, I can do all these other styles of films and still do fine. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause like even Cousins, you know, most people don't talk about Cousins, but it's like Lost Boys was enough to carry people ignoring Cousins, you know? Right, right. And again, I think you know, he put out a film every two years. We're going to get even mm-hmm. more in the 90s, but I'm really appreciating the career that Joel built for himself here. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to add? I can't think of anything else. It was a good decade. Yeah. Again, I'm still having a lot of fun doing this show with you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, seriously, this whole run of films is one of those ones that makes me just really glad I did this project because it's introducing me to this whole wide berth of films that I've heard about but never really sat down and watched. And I'm like, hey, I'm glad I watched them. Yep. Yeah. Except Slow Burn. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What was that again? Except Slow Burn. (laughs) What happened? No, I don't remember (laughs) it. I've forgotten it all. I don't what? know. No. Henry Gibson was there. That I remember. 
young Johnny Depp. Uh, young Johnny yeah. Depp in like one scene and then he's dead. Right. Uh, whatever. Yeah. My son, my heart, my son. <laughs> Anyways, let me just a little more info on that play, Speed the Plow. Joel did not direct the initial staging of it. It initially debuted at the Royale Theater on Broadway on May 3rd, 1988. Joel's version was in 1989 in the Chicago Remains Wisdom Bridge Theater. So he did a special Chicago staging of it. Okay. Now, the play was written by David Mamet. Is David Mamet a name you're familiar with? It's a name I know I'm not incredibly familiar with it. He was a very prominent playwright, especially in the 80s and 90s, then made the move into films. He's adapted a lot of his plays to films. He's written original films. He has himself directed films. He's kind of an Alan Moore type in that he's a very cantankerous old guy. Mm. who's very specific about everyone respecting the way he writes what he writes. Okay. Kind of a mixed bag for me. I think he's a very intriguing writer, but he's also kind of sloppy Mm. around the edges. And even just reading his work, it's like he literally just spits this out of a typewriter and never even does a second draft. (laughs) Oh, the typos on some of those scripts. Probably most prominent for his play and the film Glengarry Glen Ross. Mm, Okay, yeah. But other stuff that he's written, The Untouchables, How House of Games, Hoffa, Homicide, American Buffalo, The Edge, The Spanish Prisoner, Wag the Dog, Ronin, okay. State and Maine. He did a draft of Hannibal, but they didn't use that draft, even though he argued that they did, so they still had to put his name on it. <laughs> And uh, he also created the TV series The Unit. Okay. But yeah, so he still very prominent in the theater community. So the original Broadway debut of Speed the Plow, it's a three-character play, and it mm. originally starred Joe Montana, Ron Silver, and Madonna. Hmm. Okay. The original staging, it was nominated that year for Tony's for Best Play and Best Direction, and Ron Silver won for Best Actor. Okay. Joel's staging of the play in March initially starred in the two male roles, William Peterson, who was in Cousins, mm. and D.W. Moffat, who character actor he's recently been on Friday Night Lights. Oh, okay. He's one of the dads. But partway through that run, both of them stepped out. William Peterson actually kept starring in the play, but in a production in Washington. Okay. I think he was touring it. Sure. So they replaced those two with Gary Cole from Office Space and American Gothic and all that stuff. Very prominent character actor. And David Allen Novak, who a theater actor I'm not very familiar with. Hmm. And then the third actor in the women's role throughout that entire run was Hope Davis. Okay. Who still does a lot of TV, still does a lot of theater. Again, one of those actresses, if you look at a picture of her, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the play, it sounds interesting. I didn't have a chance to read it. I found a staging of it on YouTube, but it was very poorly filmed. (laughs) From what I gather from the synopsis I read, it's two producers in Hollywood, one of whom has just become a production manager, are trying to score this hot young Hollywood actor, but they also have this project. It's a novel that they're reading as a courtesy. It's this end of the world thing that they just want to turn into a typical B-action movie. Through all their debates and discussions, picking these pieces and business deals apart, the secretary comes in. She's a new secretary covering as a temp for one of the other ones. And the producer tells the production manager, hey, she's hot. You think I got a chance with her? So they make a $500 bet. Mm -hmm. The producer ends up hooking up with the secretary that night. He gets his $500. But she has read the book and convinces him that he should not only offer that book to the actor that they're trying to score, but it would be interesting if they made it more of an introspective and human story that related to the book instead of a B-action movie. Okay. The next day, we get into the office. He starts butting heads with the production manager over the direction of the project. The production manager learns that it was the secretary who pushed him towards this. It turns out that she's just doing this because she's trying to work her way into the industry and this is all a manipulation game on her part and she gets fired and that's the end of the play that's barely a story that's three acts wow i don't know there's certain types of stories that critics seem really enamored with and people like behind the scenes of movie making seems to be one of them but this is probably the most boring version of that that i've ever heard about well and to be fair that's typical of david Mamet, where it's like the story is not the important part it's the details okay glengarry glenn ross is literally just four guys at an ad agency sure that's the plot yeah and the main thrust of it is the characters and the discussion discussion and the conflicts and the drama. So does he have good dialogue at least? Yeah. I mean, he's a really good writer. I think he's an Mm -hmm. unpolished writer, but he's a very good one. He's definitely not an untalented writer. 
I guess I'm just trying to see what the appeal is. Like, I know Glenn Gary and Ross is the one where, is it Alec Baldwin's yeah. character makes that really big speech? I know that's like the whole thing of that one. So I guess maybe it's a similar thing where it's really more about a particular scene or a big moment rather than the story. And fun fact, his entire scene and speech were not in the original play. They were added for the movie. Right, right. He writes works that actors really like because they're minimalist plots and minimalist set pieces, but they're all about the drama and the dialogue and okay. the sparring. He's very much a sparring writer of two people bouncing back and forth. Okay. And again, I have not seen or read Speed the Plow. I would be curious to just if I can find a good staging of it just to see how the story plays out. Yeah. Of course, sadly, you know, Joel's was in 1989 in Chicago, so they weren't exactly filming those. Right. Even the Broadway one, there's no filmed version of that. Not even an audio version. That would be kind of interesting mm. to listen to as well. Yeah. But I do have, there were two reviews from the period that I found, one for the Chicago Tribune and one for the Chicago Reader. And I just got a couple little quick excerpts just to kind of give a sense of what they thought of Joel's version. Mm. Richard Christensen of the Chicago Tribune. Joel Schumacher, a film director who makes his theatrical debut with this production, has strengthened his staging of the play in everything from interpretive details to basic scene blocking. The play zips along on a fast, hard drive, humming with precise timing. Speed the Plow is as exhilarating and as frightening as a quick, brutal boxing match. It's a play of swift punches and counterpunches and eventually of split decisions. There's evil here, of course, but it's an ebullient, ebullient, that's not a word I come across, ebullient, 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 I believe, of, of ebullity of the evil, <laughs> but it's an evil against which an imperfect fumbling good has no chance and Mehmet can't help but salute it. Just going off the quote now, it's kind of a repugnant story. Right. It's a play that's very much exploring how repugnant these guys are. Okay, yeah. And how it's a very profit-driven thing. It's a B-action movie. They're trying to score an actor who's not really that big, but mm -hmm. he's big to them. And it's very much an expose of shitty Hollywood people. Right, and they're trying to do this bet and take advantage of her, but she's also trying to take advantage of them, obviously. Right. So, yeah. And the thing about Mamet, he's worked in and out of Hollywood. He hates Hollywood. <laughs> And again, it's worth remembering he wrote Wag the Dog, which is all about Hollywood literally staging a war to help a president. Right. And then Anthony Adler of the Chicago Reader, his review was a little densely written, so it was hard to pull quotes from, but just got a couple. Mm -hmm. You've heard of must-sees. David Mamet's Speed the Plow is definitely a must-see. Not only because it's very, very good, but because you've got to see it if you want to find out what makes it so good. Speed the Plow is not only not a dud, it's a masterpiece. A Brechtian satire with Chekhovian ambiguities. Harsh and subtle, painful and cool, compassionate and hilariously nasty under Joel Schumacher's cunning direction. So it does honestly make me want to see what Joel would have done with it. Yeah, the start of the first quote's kind of like, look, it's good, just trust me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had a hard time trying to explain why. That reads like a review written by the theater critic for the Chicago. <laughs> yeah. But I'd be curious. Apparently, he kept the sets pretty minimal. It was just a very stripped down, just let the actors play off each other. Mm -hmm. But apparently, he really pounded it at a good pace, staged it well. I would believe it because I think Joel, he's a talented guy. And I think he could have done a really good job on stage with anything. Sure. That's really all I got. So anything else you want to add before we wrap up? No, can't think of anything else. All right, so that's going to bring our 1980s decade recap to a close. And just a quick word, we are going to be taking a couple of months off from the main show before we dive into the 90s. But we've got a special surprise that I'm not going to reveal that we're going to slip in there as a little bonus between the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. And I think people will get a real kick out of it. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to both of them. <laughs> so anyways, good night, Angie. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. And Angie, did you recommend DC Cab? I believe so. It, yes, you it, did. I, okay. <laughs> what, why do you even ask me if you already know? <laughs> I thought you would remember. Uh, no, please. Okay.
wait till we get to one of the later movies. <laughs> if it helps, I think you did all of them, but Slow Burn and Cousins. Makes sense. Was that, I'm not going to ask if you recommended it because I've learned now. <laughs> no.